Hey everyone, this is Brian at F Studios here. Um, currently, I'm just putting together this video in a really basic format, just me, camera, and that's it. Uh, my computer is down, so not a lot of access to some video editing software to really make this more professional looking setup. But I just wanted to get to, out there uh, and talk with everybody a bit about mastering. I'm a member of a number of forums online for home recording and it just seems that despite the amount just the troves of data and information that's out there on the subject of mastering the majority of the people really don't understand what it really is <clears throat> uh, the majority of people seem to think it's where the magic fairy dust gets sprinkled onto their mix and, and all of a sudden it starts to sound it ends up sounding professional Others say, oh, it's just where you make your music louder. And, you know, that's not really it. That's not what mastering is. In short, mastering is the process of taking uh, the master mix and transferring it to the medium that's going to be used to duplicate and distribute the product. Uh, and a lot of times, you know, for a lot, most of the time, it was a process that took in a lot of, into account of a lot of skill and a lot of work, because you're taking a mix that sounded really great on the medium it was made on, but you're putting it into a medium that cannot reproduce the same quality of sound. You're still wanting it to sound as close to the original uh, medium as possible, if not exactly like it. And to try and help uh, explain this, I'm going to uh, kind of just go through a little bit of a short history of the process. And we're going to go all the way back to where, you know, records were first starting to be produced, uh, even the beginning of sound recording in general. And to do that, you know, we got to go back into the Wayback Machine and back to the 1800s, uh, early 1900s. And we're going to focus strictly on the record process at this time. So early... 1900s, late 1800s, it used to pretty much be that the uh, musicians would just come into the studio and they would set up in a room and the recording engineer would have them set up and place them around the room so that they would all blend well together with where the mics are positioned in the room. Probably even if it's just one microphone. And this was set up into whatever board or device they're used to amplify the signal from the mic, which then goes directly into the cutting machine, the lathe that cuts the original vinyl or, you know, the original disc that's used to create the stamps that are then put on the presses to create all the duplicate vinyl records to be sent out for distribution. If you ever watched the movie, Oh Brother, Where Art Thou, there's a pretty good representation of this. When the characters go to the radio station to record a song, it pretty much shows how it works. They're in the room, there's a mic there, there's a record cutter back in there that cuts the actual original master record, and that's the way it was. But now in the 1940s, magnetic tape was introduced to the world, made its, made its way into the studios, and eventually made its way to, uh, well, getting us to the point to where we could get multi-track recordings. But when the studios started using magnetic tape, well, the consumer isn't using any kind of a product that will play that format. They're still using records. So now... This is where the modern day mastering uh, engineer actually seems to start. You know, this is, this is where all the practices begin that we see or think of in mastering today. Now it's the job of the mastering engineer to make sure the music that is on that tape, it transfers properly to the record. And in the beginning, it probably wasn't all that hard. I mean, the sound quality of both probably wasn't all that great at the time. Um, I mean, we can just listen to old, old music from the 40s and so forth and hear for ourselves just how great or not so great it really sounded. But so the mastering engineer at the time, all the real concern would have to be is just setting up the playback machine so it can handle the tapes and play them at the right speed. There's no issues with any kind of dirt. The heads are calibrated properly. And then do the similar thing to the cutting lathe. Uh, set it up for the right speed, 
and and uh, set it up so it's going to cut at the right record, the right size record, or, you know, what, however, whatever it entails, right? And the mastering engineer, they had to work with producers and the artists to figure out like what arrangements the song was going to be in, or all the songs, and they had to work on uh, deciding, um, you know, or knowing how the effect of the speed of the record and and you know how large it was going to be would affect. Um, the fidelity of the music and just how loud it could be because louder music takes more space on a record uh, high fidelity music had, needs to have a higher speed of record playback and that is the reason why in most for the most part that we would see that um, a lot of the more energetic higher fidelity songs on records would be at the front of the record on the outside of the disc where it's moving the fastest because those are going to provide or produce the highest resolutions for that format outside of that at the beginning stage you know early 1940s or it's probably not that much more complicated for the mastering engineer to do but as time moves on technology advances and it gets to a point to where uh, both the technology for record and tape advances enough to that their sound quality improves. But it isn't long that it, for the sound quality of the tape to start to surpass what can be done on the record. And so this is where we get into the mastering engineer actually having to manipulate the sound so that it works properly on the record. So let's, you know, the mixing engineers, they're just working to make something actually sound the best they could possibly sound. And they're in competition with other mixing studios and other engineers. They want to be able to give their clients the best result. So that's all they're really concerned about. Then they send it off to the mastering engineer to be put on a record. And that mastering engineer has to listen to it and go is, and think to themselves, is this going to work or is it not? If the bass is too strong you can have issues with skipping there's tons of information online about how this could be a problem your low frequencies will create skipping problems on your record if they're if it's too loud and your high frequencies if your high frequencies are louder and noticeable pretty much anything above 10k starts to create problems with the cutting lathe on those machines when they're cutting the uh, initial record they can't respond fast enough to those higher frequencies. So instead of cutting a nice smooth sine wave, they end up just cutting a square wave. And so you're getting, instead of getting a nice high signals, uh, high frequency signals, you're getting distortion. So the mastering engineers now have to implement tools to deal with these problems to make this mix work for the limitations of the record. So they're going to be introducing compression. Uh, they're going to be introducing uh, multi-band compression, possibly. You're going to have low-pass filtering, high-pass filtering. You're going to have de-essing coming into the picture. And any other number of tools that will make it so this album that is recorded on tape will actually physically work properly on the record while also maintaining hopefully all, if not you know, at least most of the original audio quality of the re original recording and mix. And as tapes became better and better and better, that process just became harder and harder and harder to get to transfer over to vinyl and work right and sound right. And, you know, it ended up that engineers, mastering engineers, had to develop new techniques and use new tools to try to get things to work. Eventually, when stereo came around, that added even more problems. You know, it's easy to create stereo on a tape because you're running two separate tracks to get the left and right side. But on an, a record, you're trying to decode two channels, two tracks off of a single uh, group, you know. And the issues it would have, well, if you had your low frequencies pretty strong just on left or right, you could have issues with skating, the needle popping out and, and skating across the disc. Uh, you still had issues with if your low signals were too strong in the center. And, you know, I, apparently from all the information that's out there, if you were doing anything where you had strong uh, bass on the side channels, or say your toms were pretty loud, the transits were pretty strong, and they were on the side channels, 
you're gonna have to try to narrow those down. Otherwise, they are going to create issues with how the, the needle and your machine, your record player, is gonna be able to play that record after it's been cut. You're also gonna wanna make sure all your frequencies at 100 hertz or lower are centered, dead centered. Uh, there's also issues where when stereo effects were starting to be applied, like stereo phasing effects. You can't have a really wide stereo phased effect on a record because the needle just does not like being pulled in two directions at once. So all of that stuff has to be narrowed. So now the mastering engineer is also employing um, panning controls possibly, mid-side processing where they can narrow the stereo, stereo field. They may end up being breaking down the, uh, the signal through a multi-band compressor into three or four different bands and then running those different bands themselves into separate mid-side processing setups on their mixing console just to make this work for that vinyl record. And it wasn't until 74 that a new cutting lathe finally was introduced into the, into the industry that allowed the records themselves to be able to do better, uh, reproduce better. So now in 74 we start to get better quality out of the records again and it's starting to sound better than if they used to and it's easing the restrictions and the limitations on what the mastering engineers could do to the record. And this kind of analysis, this kind of mentality, this kind of way of having to do things applied to records, four and eight track cartridges, cassette tapes, all the way up until we got to CD. Once we got to CD, we finally had a medium that, was, that we were using for distribution that would far surpass the sound quality capabilities of those professional studio tapes. Um, while the pro tapes were only, you know, best you can get out of those were probably about 22K, you know, your CD medium had the capability of running all the way up to 44.1K. And so there was a lot of space in there to be able to boost, boost up clean high frequencies from those uh, tapes to get a much cr crisper sound on, this, on the new medium. And then with the new tools that were coming in, how they were designed, the new digital compressors and, and the new digital uh, uh, effects such as, uh, such as uh, reverbs and delays and all the different things you could do with all the, the new tools, it allowed the engineers to start to push the boundaries much farther than what they used to, both in the mixing stage and in the mastering stage. <clears throat> and this is why, you know, in the beginning, we ended up getting CDs that uh, a lot of people were thinking, well, there's, it, they, they sound too digital. They, there's too much high end. It's too crisp. It, it hurts my ears. It's, it's because, basically, we opened up the floodgates to what these engineers used to be able to do. They give, they've got a whole new platform now. It's like, we look at how much we can really push this out now and just hear the, the crispness, the fidelity, the, the air that's coming through and, and all those kind of things can now be trans, translated properly for uh, regular production that we would consume as a music listener because our CD medium is way better than anything we've had in the past. But, you know, of course, people have their uh, own opinions of what sounds good or whatnot, and they're not used to this, and it kind of bugs them or whatever, and they just like that older sound where it's, it's mo more mellow or whatnot, right? So anyway, now, for the most of you that are out there, we're looking to get our music set up on streaming systems. Streaming systems are, once again, they're using, well, they're using lossy audio formats now. So once again, we've gone from uh, a high fidelity system to now wanting to transfer our mixes onto a system that's going to be a low fidelity system in comparison to what we had before. And the way the algorithms uh, com compress music audio is they basically go through and eliminate a lot of the harmonics that we don't normally hear unless we were to boost frequency ranges that those harmonics sit in. 
And under a normal circumstances, and the, the average listener would never be able to tell this, but when you put it on, say, a high-end system and side-by-side -side with a full wave file, um, and say, start boosting the frequencies to enhance the sound or whatnot, you'll hear, definitely hear the difference. You'll get a nice, fuller, richer sound out of the uncompressed wave file, and the lossy file is gonna sound hollow. It's missing something. It just does not sound anywhere near as good. But this is the audio format that we now have to work with because this is what has become the mainstream method of consumption by con you know consumers. Because it's convenient. You don't have to carry around a bunch of records or a bunch of tapes or CDs. Now, you don't even have to carry around a little player that holds it, all your music in memory. Now, it just streams to you. But to stream it, it has to be severely compressed in order to be able to work within the bandwidths that we have capable right now. So what does this mean to you as somebody who's a home recording, mixing, and mastering engineer wanting to get your music out there? Right now, in today's age, if you're doing this all yourself, like the majority of people out there are, you're mostly producing your music um, with samples and MIDI. Uh, the music, the sounds, the tones are already pretty much set up to work and sound good. All you gotta do is then just tweak your EQs basically, things like that, and maybe a little bit of dynamics processing just to make sure that the sounds you choose all blend well together within your mix. When it comes to mastering, you really don't have to do a whole lot. Uh, it's not like you're dealing with people whose, you know, the intensity that they play at it varies. There's and uh, how they play their instrument varies, and you know, you have to deal with that 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 level of well, you're not having to deal with that level of uh, variation, for lack of a better word, at the moment, uh, from having to record live people acoustically. <clears throat> So a lot of the work for you guys can really just be done strictly in mastering, or excuse me, strictly in your mixing, just by setting up levels with some really basic controls. Now, artistically, you're not limited to that. You can do whatever you want, but just to get a good sound that's going to work right, or sound right, it doesn't really require a lot. Now, for those of you who are recording more acoustically, yeah, you do have to put in a bit more work to get everything to set right because it doesn't all just sit within a nice, you know, dynamic range. You know, you got to smooth those transitions, smooth those transients. You got to smooth everything out to make it all fit right before you jump to the next step. If any of that is making sense to you guys right now. So what's your concern about for mastering is you just want to make it so that it works for the lossy file. Uh, it's your choice whether or not to you add a bunch of enhancements uh, to your master file. Uh, again, that's just an artistic choice. It's not a necessity to make it sound good or be competitive online with the, all the music that's out there. In fact, with everything that's out there and how easily accessible it's gotten for the home user, it's better that you don't sound like everybody else and that you have some originality, not just in how you create your music, but the sound itself. It, it just helps you stand out better. So in mastering in today's age, the only real thing you need to worry about is your levels, your overall levels. Lossy files don't work well with uh, loud files. You're going to want to make sure that you keep your peaks of your transients or whatever below about 1 dB, negative 1 dB. And the reason why is because when you go run your, uh, when your track gets run through the conversion process to, be, to become a compressed file, whether it's MP3 or any of the others, the algorithms that do that, for some reason, have a tendency to increase the peaks by about a depth of 1 dB. And if you get your peaks always up there above that zero dB spot, you then run the risk of hearing the digital artifacts that comes in from the compressed distortion of the, of the MP3 file. 
and and it always seems to come out sounding like um, a high pass filter has been placed around the mid upper mid range and then a chorus has been placed on that or a phaser or flangers and it just sounds bad so it's you want to keep those transients and the peaks down below there so you don't really run into those issues uh, having an occasional peak go up a little bit, like 0.8 dB, 1, 1 dB, you know, here and there, it's not going to be very it noticeable. It won't be noticeable, actually. But if you constantly have it up there, it's going to, you're going to hear these artifacts, and you don't want that. As far as how loud to master it, as long as you're not hitting those peaks, you really can master it just as loud as you want. It really should just be dependent on how the song uh, is, is actually... It feels with whatever level of loudness you're, you're mastering it at. How much compression are you really going to have on there with your uh, percussion instruments as opposed to your non-percussion instruments and how they interact. So if you want to boost it up there, you can. Because all the websites do for the streaming sites is just normalize. All that means is they just turn the volume down. And let's face it, I mean, despite everybody else out there that says, oh, well, you, you get a louder performance with a less compressed audio or stuff. That has not been my experience at all. You know, negative 12 LUFS is negative 12 LUFS, no matter how you slice it. Uh, your perceived level of loudness is still going to be dependent upon how the mix itself was done. Now, um, there's a guy that's on YouTube who... He's a pretty good mixing engineer, and he's pretty good at mastering and whatnot. He does a lot of helpful YouTube tutorials. But there was one thing when he popped up in the same argument or discussion about what levels to set your mastering at. He was trying to show what everybody else shows. That, look, you get this uncompressed, really dynamic track where it shows your peaks are spiking way up to almost 0 dB, one d negative 1 dB. And then here's the mastered, heavily mastered loud track, and it shows that it's really loud with a really um, heavily compressed track, and it's almost a solid brick wall of, of you know waveform on there. And then he shows what the effects are of having them run through uh, the process to be uploaded to Spotify or uh, any of the other streaming sites, and he shows. The one that was mastered with only a minimal compression, he says, it only changed this much. There's still a lot of headroom there, a lot of information that's being used. You know? And then he shows the highly compressed one that was really loud before, and it shows it's all compressed down here. So we're, our scale, we're going to say, is like from 0 dB, to, and the middle is 0.5. So 0 dB is where the transients and everything are peaking at, and 0.5 is where... The highly compressed file got mixed down to to be let's just say negative 12 LUFS right <clears throat> here's the thing we are not perceiving loudness by how loud these really quick transients come through we are perceiving loudness by how loud the sustained notes are uh, the sustained tones and if you look at the graphs of the two different types of mastering, your transients and stuff will be peaking around the zero dB point in our uh, hypothetical graph here. But your, the rest of your music, for your singing is, your instruments such as your keyboards, your guitars, your synthesizers, your horns, they are all hovering, hovering around that 0.5 mark, okay? Now when you end up taking that really loud file and compress it down to uh, the negative 12 LUFS, everything is hovering around that negative 0.5 or that 0.5 mark. Not just your percussion, but your instrumentation is still there in that range too. All you're doing, all you have done is you've squashed down your, your transients in that particular spot, whatever they hit. It's been squashed down. And if your limiter is set properly or your compressor is set properly, your ear doesn't detect that drop in volume from everything else. It's just instantaneous. All you hear is the percussion instrument 
and then when it fa as it fades out the rest of the volume from the other instrumentation in this master come back up into place so you don't hear the pulsing you don't hear any of the problems like that it sounds nice and smooth so when you play it back you can play both side by side they will sound equally as loud because your instrumentation that that actually creates our perception of loudness the ones that create the sustained notes they're at the same volume level as the other track was with the master that wasn't compressed as hard when you've normalized everything to that negative 12 LUFS so the difference in what you hear in your mixes and other mixes as being theirs louder really comes down to how you're mixing your song not how you're mastering your song uh, case in point I recently refinished up a song uh, conflicts of men which is kind of like an Iron Maiden kind of sound or whatever you know kind of a British heavy metal sound music right and I uh, uploaded and everything and you know listening to it Comparing it to other similar tracks, it seems like it might be a little bit quieter. Even though when I mastered it, I mastered it around 9.7, negative 9.7 LUFS. Because that's just where everything seemed to sit best when I brought the limiters into, into play. And then it gets dropped down to play, and to whatever gets dropped down on all the different streaming sites. They have all different, their different uh, um, levels that they, they want everything set at or normalize at. And I'm listening, and, you know, it, yeah, it sounds a little quieter, but then I really start paying attention to it. And I'm wearing earphones, and I can, I can get a sense for the amount of pressure that's happening inside there, the air pressure. And that, you know, the feeling of it, it's the same. So I start really looking into what's the difference here? What's going on between... The track I was just listening to, and it was a track from the band Tigers of Pantang, and my track. And the real big difference came down to my mix. I had stronger bass from my guitar than they did. I had a stronger kick drum than they did. And I like to mix my stuff more like, uh, you know, I hear from the 70s or whatnot, where he had really nice, rich, full bass guitars, and and he um, had some. You could have some pretty heavy, you know, kicks and whatnot. But it's like the bass guitar itself. I use a Westminster Jazz, which, from what I'm told, it's a copy of a Fender Precision. It's a really heavy bass, and it's a single coil pickup, but it has a really nice full tone to it. And I mean. You, if you were to put a high pass filter on this bass, you can literally hear when a difference being made once you start getting that high pass filter up around the 40 hertz mark. It's already starting to lose some of that, that, that low end that makes it sound the way it sounds. <coughs> so I like to mix that bass in there, not heavy, but I like all those rich low sub elements in that sound because it just makes it fill out now the tigers of pantang song didn't have that level of fullness and their bass was turned down much more and it was much shallower um the kick drum didn't have the resonation mind in it was it was uh much tighter uh the resonation the resonance was muted you know much more it didn't sustain for any uh, near the length of time that mine did um, their vocals were pushed higher towards the front than mine were, and this allowed for a lot more headroom on the master bus. And being that it gave more headroom, that meant you could actually push the volumes up higher. So the volume of what we were hearing now, more predominantly, uh, say the ratio, between the guitar tones, which are mid-range frequencies, and the bass tones, from the bass guitar, there's a much greater uh, separation between those. Uh, you got a, a bigger dB separation between your bass and your guitars. And now you're able to pump your volume up even higher because you got that much more headroom on your master bus channel with the bass guitars and things not being as loud. And 
when I turn around and I play these tracks side by side with my track and I turn my bass down to get within the same volume level that their bass is at, I now can boost my volume output up of the overall mix and now it's starting to sound pretty much in line with what they have. We perceive mid-range volumes much easier than we do low range and high range fr frequencies. Um, so yeah, our mid-range frequencies, it doesn't take as much amp amperage, as much voltage for us to hear them as easily as we would hear the lower and higher frequencies. Therefore, it's just easier for us to uh, perceive those. We feel it's louder when those are louder. So when we're working on things, we have, like in the mix, this is where the volume is really going to come from. How loud can we make it seem? Now, when the machine is calculating your LUFS level, it's still taking into account uh, the levels and the voltage being produced from the low frequency instruments and the high frequency stuff to where you have it. You know, I, my understanding is, is that the LUFS measurement is supposed to be more in line with how we perceive hearings as similar to um, how pink noise is more in line with how we perceive uh, sound as opposed to white noise. LUFS is supposed to be something similar, more accurate for our perception of loudness. But it still works off an of an algorithm that w that is calculating the levels of the whole frequency spectrum. So if you want your highs, if you want your mid-ranges to be louder so everything actually sounds louder to you, then you need to manage how it integrates or interacts with your low frequencies and your high frequencies within the mixing stage. There's only so much you could do within the mastering stage if you're working with a file that's already been mixed down. <clears throat> if you want to break things up, you could try to use band filtering and, and uh, multi-band compression. But still, it will only take you so far. You're still better off to do all that stuff in the mix side of it when you have individual control of all your different tracks. So the loudness issue with people having during the mastering stage saying, my mix doesn't sound as loud as this does over here, if they're even mastering it by that time, always comes down to how they mixed it. If they have more energy in their low end than what they really should have in comparison to other tracks, your mid-range frequencies that you're going to perceive better and what tell you things are louder is not going to be as pronounced as it should or would be otherwise. So that's really where the problem with your loudness comes from. Now, issues like with the, uh, well, how the loudness wars came about and the reason why engineers are, are, are adding all these other things on there, like now with the big thing where I always keep reading about is everybody talking about saturation and this and that. This all has to come down to basic competition between the individuals in the industry. They want to be the best. They want to be able to outdo the other person. So they all do their thing. They all do their job. They all, they all come in and listen to a mix and analyze it and figure out what do I need to do to make this work right for the system. But they also go through to figure out is this going to translate well to all the other audio systems out there? Not just high-end all the audio systems, but um, low-range audio systems. I mean, even cell phones. And they want to actually make the best sounding record possible still. So the ones who are given the freedom to do so, they put their own touches on these things because mastering engineers are audiophiles too. They love music. They love the sound of music. They want to make it sound as great as they can. So then the, the music comes out, the, the charts are released, you see who won, and then the other engineers look at that and go, I have to beat this. I got to figure out what they did. I got to beat this. So all through the generations, this has lent their, itself to where the engineers are trying to add their own personal touches to try and improve the sound or how to make it sound better, not just for their client's benefit, but for their own. And when CD came around with the capabilities it had, uh, loudness became a thing because some engineer was able to come on and they were able to get a louder master than what has been done previously. And that thing 
took precedence in the charts. People were talking about it. It's wow, this is nice and loud. This sounds great. So the next engineer comes around and says, I got to do the same thing, but I got to do better. How can I make it louder? How can I just make it stand out more? And that's basically how the loudness war started. That's how they continued on. And it's just an issue about competition. Who can be the best uh, overall? You know, who can do better than the last guy did? Um, really, all you want to worry about, though, in mastering is just make sure, just make sure that your master is on par as far as its volume and stuff with everything else that's out there. There's no real industry standard that says, well, you ha it has to be an average of this or that. Not that I'm aware of. I've never seen anything like that. If that was the case, then all the streaming services would already run it. There's an industry standard in the film, film industry, and I think there's some industry standards on volume within the radio industry itself. But when it comes to just producing the music, getting it on the product that's going to be distributed, I don't think there's any hard standard on that. I could be wrong. I've never really looked that deeply into it. But bottom line, all you want to do is make sure that your music is relatively the same level as everything else that's out there, especially for, for uh, everything that comes from a high-end pro studio. Because you don't want the listeners turning their volume up or down while they're playing your track and going to the next track or whatever. The listener doesn't want to have to deal with that. And that's one of the reasons for the normalization process, if not the only reason for the normalization process, that the streaming sites are implementing. And it's not hard to do. I mean, all you got to do if you're new at this is just stick in your reference tracks, hear how loud they are with your volume set a certain way, and then you just work to make your master that level too. And all it really requires is that you use a limiter to bring down your transients that will give you the headroom then to boost the rest of your music back up. Uh, adding saturation, all that kind of stuff. You want to add saturation for the extra harmonics got to remember, a lot of stuff is still going to be taken out as soon as it hits the streaming service and gets converted. Um, you want to add it to get that effect like it's done on anal analog equipment or whatever. Strictly artistic. It, that's all it is. It's not a necessity for the mastering stage. Not even a necessity as a professional master. Your whole point at being a professional mastering engineer is just to make sure that the music sounds as good as it can. Um, based on your artist and producer's perception of what they want. If they give you any freedom to do what you think should be done with it, you know, fine, go ahead. But it's not a necessity to do the same thing over and over and over. That's why you don't bother asking or thinking about what plugin should be on my mastering chain. Only use what's necessary. Don't have it all set up the same way all the freaking time. Not every song needs saturation. Not every song needs reverb. Not every song needs delay. Not every song needs a chorus. Not every song needs anything. Basically, all you will ever really need for mastering that is a necessity is going to be a compressor or a limiter and a surgical EQ. Because you may have to go in there and you may have to tame frequencies. You may have to t uh, uh, boost certain things at certain times. And you're going to want to have the kind of EQ that will let you uh, get really precise and do that. Um, if you have issues where you're playing, uh, you're mastering uh, a, an artist that was recorded acoustically, you might have points where something came through a little too loud and, or a little too soft. And at that point, yeah, you're going to want to go ahead and implement multiband compression. Um, you may have something where your sibilances are just too strong, so your de-esser now comes into play. Uh, your mid-side processing now, it's now turned mostly into an artistic taste. You don't need it to fix things to make work on a medium anymore. Now it's just, you have your stereo master, everything sounds great, and there's this one section that might just do a little better if the stereo width was a little bit wider and louder sounding. So. You take your mid-side processing and you get a little boost. But you can use mid-side processing to help increase the, the brilliance of the like, cymbals 
or the harmonies on the outside channels or a little more punch just to the kick or the low end or a little more compression on the, just the center stuff and, you know it can be used for those things just to make it sound a little better give a little more pop to um, uh, the, the track the song itself and you know if it's needed to make it work right on all systems then definitely use it for that purpose so you have a track that can translate well between again your high-end system all the way to your low-end system but outside of that mastering is not a big deal it is a skill set it is something that requires a lot of time and work to master itself but it is not something where you have to be totally confused by the process especially if you're just a home recorder that wants to get their music up on streaming sites you want to be the best you can be work on that part in the mixing stage then when it comes to mastering all you really need to worry about is just setting your limiters so that your peaks are right where they need to be uh, you get your LUFS reading set up so that it's loud enough that it will translate to all the other streaming platforms and just be turned right down to where they want theirs to be so you don't have to worry about that because some sites I've seen will turn their LUF their their volume up for tracks that are too quiet but not all the majority of them will leave those alone so you want your tracks to be a little louder so that that one mix is going to work or that one master is going to work for everything including if you are going to put it on cd or you're going to put it on a lossless audio setup that doesn't use normalization you want it to have the proper levels and then just let the machines on the other end do their work wherever the music gets sent off to um as far as people using things like ozone to do their masters this and that yeah, it's just a tool. It's not a one-size-fits-all kind of thing. Um, a lot of people are using it for that, though. And I, I, don't, I don't necessarily agree with that practice, but that's my opinion. As a mastering engineer, you should really just sit down, listen to the track, and hear for yourself what it needs, what it doesn't need, and take care of things uh, yourself. Don't try to fit within... A predetermined um, form of how loud your low end should be, how loud your high high end should be, and how loud your mid range should be. Yeah, I mean, that might be the range based on everybody else has been analyzed by the system when they were developing it, but it's too simplified. So anyway, I, I hope I explained things well enough here. I'm kind of running out of ideas and, and things to talk about on this. And I don't want to just ramble on about nothing. Um, if you do have any questions, I'm always free to ask if you want. I will answer the best of my abilities. Other than that, you know, just keep learning. But really, just search online right now for information about this stuff. Because there's so much information available, it shouldn't be an issue with that you have to turn around and ask people about you should be able to figure out exactly what mastering is now. Mastering now is the same as it was way back when. The idea though is, is now you're dealing with a lossy odd digital audio format that you have limitations that you have to keep your mix constrained by. And aside from that, the sky is the limit on what you could do. Everything else is an artistic choice to what you feel sounds good or not. Don't ask everybody else for their opinion on what sounds good because you'll get you'll ask a hundred th different people and you'll get a hundred different opinions. There is no book that says this is what you do here, here, and here, and then that's just it. There's no rules here. You know, you just do what you need to do to make the thing sound good, and only you can figure that out for yourself as to how it, what it needs to be done from listening to it. If it needs to have compression, if it needs to have mid-side processing, if it needs to have uh, multi-band compression or a dynamic EQ, if, you know, it's up to you and only you can figure that out. Everything else is just, you know, gravy. It's just uh, artistic expression, which outside of what you want to represent for the song, doesn't really matter. You can make it sound good, work on all the systems, that's it. That's all you really have to worry about. 
Anyway, I'm out. I don't really uh, do these videos much anymore. I don't have a lot of time. I'm going to be setting the studio up here, the live room up here, with the drum kit again here in the near future because I'm got i going to be re-recording drum tracks for an old production from uh, about 13 years ago, 14 years ago, and getting a new mix so this thing can be re-released today and actually have an official commercial release, not just a demo. As far as the rest of the recordings and the performances go, everything was great. It's just the drums were not recorded at optimum, uh, you know, capabilities. And now we're going to do that for the client. And it's going to, uh, hopefully, it turns out really well. It's, I, I think it's going to be a really fun project. And if you guys are interested in uh, knowing more about that as things progress, just um, go ahead and like the page. Go, go to my Facebook page, which is uh, F Studios. At, uh, so it's F Studios. Uh, music and video. So it'll be facebook.com slash fstudios music and video. You know, you like that page and you can follow there what's going on and uh, still occasionally pick up some bits and pieces of advice and stuff for myself. Some videos showing uh, mixing and mastering. Some videos uh, just bullshitting about what's going on. But, you know, if you're all you're out doing is looking for videos, and for, I'm not one of those guys who just does a ton of videos because I prefer actually working on um, the music and stuff on that side of the camera as opposed to just doing videos about this stuff but every once in a while like this time I feel like you know I need to say something about what's going on because people just aren't getting it it's not as complicated as they're making it out to be but it's not necessarily the easiest thing in the world either if mixing and mastering was easy everybody would be doing it and right now most everybody doing it is relying on a machine and that will take care of it for them one way or the other they're not doing it by themselves so anyway if you uh, just really want to do it and just keep working on it just and get rid of the machinery the algorithms that take care of all the crap for you make sure you figure out ways to do that for yourself experiment and learn new methods and Basically come up with your own style, your own brand, your own sound. That will differentiate you, not just as an artist, but a mixing engineer or a mastering engineer for everybody else. And that will help you stand out in this vast ocean of mediocrity that's out there right now. Anyway, guys, take it easy. I'm Brian, F Studios. Talk to you later.